Um, welcome to Austin from myself as well. First question to the audience, how many of you have heard of BPF, Berkeley Packet Filter? Well, that's a good bunch. Those, those that did not raise their hand, how many of you have used TCP dump? All right, so if you specify a filter, if you're on TCP, TCP dump and you specify a filter, that, B, that filter will be compiled into BPF and runs inside a kernel, will actually decide which package should be displayed. So you've all been using BPF for quite a while. What I'm going to talk about is how we took BPF and evolved it into the next step and make it applicable to network security, low balancing, networking, and so on. Well, first of all, who is that guy? Um, those who've never heard of me, what I have been doing is help the biggest monolith ever, which is basically this thing. <laughs> so I've been doing kernel development for the last 15 years. Uh, I was at Red Hat for a long while, and recently at Cisco, and two months ago, we started a company around Cilium. This monolithic th thinking of Linux kernel is going to change, though. Um, and I'm not talking about Linux kernel modules. I'm talking about BPF. Because as we, if you look into how Linux kernel operate, it gets I.O. from like, uh, devices, network devices, storage devices. You have user, user space applications, containers, interacting with the kernel through system calls. And then with BPF, we can actually start building something that looks very much like microservices. So we can build services components that implement specific behaviors, security, low polarity, networking, and then glue them together. This is what BPF is doing inside the kernel. And this is what this talk is going to be about. So BPF is revolutionizing lots of things. The most prominent one right now is tracing and profiling. And there is a talk from Brendan, Brendan Gregg tomorrow, um, 1 to 30 p.m., container performance, and how you can apply BPF to profile containers and figure out like, why performance is the way it is. What I'm talking, so I'm not going to fo focus on tracing or profiling. What I will talk about is networking and security and how we apply BPF to solve these things. To give you some context on like why, why didn't we even bother, why, why do we care? Let's look at how applications are being deployed. Many years ago, we had servers that hosted a single application. You, you set up a server and that server was running, for example, a mail server. You set it up, maybe even a manual process, and then that server run for a year, years. And you would ideally never touch it again. You would only apply security fixes. In the age of virtualization, we started deploying into VMs, and we started to deliver more frequently. But you would still, you, most people would still name their VMs. They would still be pets, they would not be cattle. Um, with microservices, we're going into a stage where you deploy multiple times a day, and you need a lot of tooling um, to actually do that. And that's why we're all here, right? That's what you care about. We need this um, um, agility. How did like, infrastructure, in particular network security, like, evolve in this phase? The reality is that the majority, if not all of it, still runs on top of IP tables. So no matter how, what sort of abstraction and automation you have, you have at the top layer, in the end, it gets somehow translated to IP tables rules, which will match on IPs and port numbers. IP tables has not been designed and has not been developed for microservices. I know because I have helped build IP tables. <laughs> the, second, the second aspect is your HTTP ports look something like this, right? You run tons of stuff over your HTTP ports. Like, Years ago, you would know by looking at a port number what kind of application runs on that port. For example, 25, that's a mail server. 20, 22, that's SSH, right? 80 was hosting web services. You were not running arbitrary API calls through a port. These days, everything runs eventually over, on, over only a single port, which means as you open up that port, you open up all of the traffic and all of the API calls, all of the requests that go over that port. So let's look at an example um, why that is a problem. And the example is Gordon is looking for a job. And Gordon will, will um, talk to a, another microservice called Chop Postings. The Chop Posting service exposes an API. So it has multiple API endpoints. Like you can check the health of the microservice. You can, 
you can get uh, jobs, you can post jobs, and you can modify posts, posts. Gordon wants to retrieve a job. Gordon wants to see the job postings. So in, in um, traditional network security, what you would do is you would apply an IP tables rules, which would allow Gordon to talk to the job posting service on port 80. This is what you do with layer three, layer four network security. While doing this, or by doing this, you also expose all, or open up all the other API endpoints to Gordon. So even though Gordon does only do a get to slash jobs, he could also do a post, he could also do a put, and he could even retrieve the health information, something that you don't want um, Gordon to do. So this is not exactly least privilege. This is not least privilege, least, uh, privilege at all. The security team is definitely not abused. So what do we want? We want to be able to apply fine-grained security policies at API call at HTTP level. This means Gordon should only be able to do a get to slash jobs. Um, all other API points, API endpoints should be protected from Gordon. That sounds neat. We demand a demo, right? That, that sounds too good to be true. So I'm gonna show you a demo, and the demo will run inside my VM, and because I'm very bad at typing, it's a scripted demo, but it runs in my, uh, inside a VM on my laptop. So the demo has a story, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the storyline. First of all, is the, is the font big enough, or should I increase it a little bit? There we go. All right, people are tweeting me. <laughs> awesome. All right, so a long time ago in a container cluster far, far away, it is a period of civil war. The empire has adopted microservices and CD. Despite this, rebel, uh, rebel spaceships striking from a hidden cluster have won their first victory against the evil galactic empire. During the battle, the rebel spies managed to steal the Swagger API specification to the empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star. This is the storyline for our, our demo, so let's dig in. So I'm demonstrating Cilium here, um, and in order to integrate Cilium with Docker, you, you, you use the lib network API. So we create a lib network network. Uh, we had the command docker network create, and we assign the driver type Cilium into IPAM, IPAM driver type Cilium. And we create a network named space. In order for the empire to create a Death Star, they launch a container. So they launch a container, they attach it to the network space, um, they give it the name Death Star, and they assign a label to the container, which is ID Empire Death Star, because it's a, it's a Death Star that belongs to the empire. And it runs a container image, Cilium slash Star Wars. It's a public image, you can pull it and toy with, toy with uh, yourself. In order for spaceships to land on the Death Star, we need a network policy. And this is what we will do right now. So we import a typical layer three, layer four network policy. The policy says the following. The first rule, it's two rules. The first rule says that any container with the, with the label ID spaceship can talk to any container with the label ID Empire Death Star. So that's the first rule of this part. That's a layer three network policy. The second rule says that if you're a container and you have the label ID Empire Death Star, then you can only take requests on port 80 incoming protocol TCP. That's a typical layer four policy. So let's try that out. We import the policy into Cilium and we launch a container and it's a ship one, it's a spaceship. So it has the label ID, ID .spaceship and we launch a container. We have Cilium list of endpoints, so Cilium is now managing two endpoints. We can see they have an endpoint ID, they have a security identity, and they have labels. They have an IPv4 address and an IPv6 address, and both are in status ready. In order to land, we will issue a curl to the Death Star to the API endpoint request landing, and the Death Star responds to another okay, ship has landed, awesome. In the meantime, the Rebel Alliance has actually noticed that the Empire started constructing a Death Star, so they will construct, or they will launch a container to send an X-Wing fighter to the Death Star to actually explore. 
So the X-Wing is in space as well, so we attach it to a network space. We give it a label, it's a spaceship, so it's, it has the label id.spaceship, and we launch it. So it flies up to the Death Star, and the first thing it does, it basically pings the Death Star. Find out we have a layer three policy, it's a spaceship that talks to the Death Star, that's fine. So the pilot thinks, awesome, I can reach the, I can reach the Death Star, so let's poke around. So it basically just does a get to slash, so it invokes curl, and it does a get slash to the Death Star, and receive some JSON back. So yes, this is a Death Star, has some attributes, and wow, it also exposes entire API specification down here. So that's a couple of endpoints, right? So we can do a get to slash v1, we can check the health, we can request landing, we can put something into the cargo by, we can get the status of the hyper matter reactor, and we can put something into the exhaust port. Hmm, that's interesting, right? We can probably do something with that. In the meantime, though, the Empire IT ops have noticed that the Rebel Alliance has come and spy on the Death Star, so they adopt the Cilium and they will apply an HTTP policy. And they will apply the following policy. The first rule is still the same. The first rule is asks that if you're, a, if you're a spaceship, you can dock to a Death Star. The second rule is actually what's new, this, this one, which, which means if you are a spaceship, you can only talk on port 80 outgoing, you can only talk TCP, and you can do the following um, layer seven rules, the following HTTP requests. So you can do a get to slash v1, or you can do a post to request landing. That's the only two operations and requests that you're allowed to do. Everything else should be protected. So we load that policy. and then the rebels return. They fly up to the Death Star and they ping again, they can ping. And then they, then they attack, right? They put something into the exhaust port, and that fails, access denied. Shields are up, demo worked. Hmm, well that, Obviously, we, all, we have all seen in the movies, we cannot end it like that, right? That would be completely wrong, seriously. So this is what you missed. While the Empire IT ops have adopted Cilium and HP proxies, the Jedi have managed to infiltrate the Death Star and actually install a different policy than what we saw. So I'm gonna run diff on the policy that we saw on the screen and the policy that was actually loaded. And there's one additional rule, so the, the second one is just a comma being added, and then this one is the new rule. So, you can do a put to the exhaust port if you have the HTTP header X has force true set. This is the policy that the Jedi managed to, to, in, to, uh, to install into the Death Star. So obviously, you all know what's going to happen. Luke is coming along, he's coming in a spaceship, and he can do a curl to put something into the exhaust port with the HTTP header uh, X has force true. And the Death Star response, service, on, service um, um, Death Star exploded. <laughs> and it actually really exploded because we can no longer ping it. All right, so much for the demo. So what we saw is that Solium can enforce HTTP policies transparently for applications without modifying the application at all, and it operates and interacts with Docker using lib network. So how, do we, how, do we, how did we do all of this? And this is where BPF comes, comes along. And um, BPF is, is really the superpowers inside Linux. It started out as this, this small component, and it's now evolving into something that will, I, what I believe will drive networking and security and visibility in Linux networking. And as we saw in the keynote announcement, because of Linux Kit and Microsoft allowing to run Linux kernels, you, could, you will be able to, to leverage BPF and Cilium on Windows kernels or on Windows platforms running Linux kernels as well. So BPF, I, will, I believe, will be the glue and the, 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 the technology that will drive a lot of security and networking going forward. 
So how did we actually do this? And this is getting a little bit technical, but this is the black belt track, so I'm supposed to be technical. If you don't get something, uh, feel free to ask questions. Otherwise, catch me later after the talk, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to walk, walk you through this in detail again. So I'm showing you how BPF allows to transparently redirect into a proxy. So we have a get request coming in. In this case, it's from the network. It could also be from a container, and it wants to go to another container. What we can do is we can run a BPF program that will see that request as it comes in, and it can redirect in, into a proxy. So it will rewrite the network packets to send it to a proxy that is running. And by doing so, we modify the, the destination IP address of the packets, which means that destination IP address is lost because we want, to, we want to redirect it away from the container where it's supposed to go to the actual proxy. And because we override or we, we, we redirect, we, we need to keep track of the original IP, and this is what we call state. So we keep track of the state um, in a so-called BPF map, and when the proxy um, looks at the packet and applies uh, the rules, and after applying the rules, it considers this, this request should go to the container, it will retrieve that state and can, can um, redirect back into the kernel or redirect to the container using the original IP address. So if you look at um, traditional proxies, what they will do is they will look at the host header inside the HTTP request to, to do the forwarding. What we do instead is we, we store and save the original IP address so we can completely uh, transparently inject proxies into, into um, a networking. If the, rule is not, if the rule does not allow for packets or for, for requests to go to the container, as we saw in the demo, we can send back a 403. So what is this BPF thing exactly? Right? You can somehow redirect H2, uh, you can somehow redirect into a proxy, you can do security, you can do networking. What exactly is it though? So BPF is, this is how BPF looks like, but nobody really wants to write it this way. It's basically a bytecode language that allows you to run um, code in the kernel in a safe environment. Um, this is the raw details. If you're interested, we have documentation um, on docs.slim.io, which explains D, uh, BPF in all the details. Although you don't, know, you don't need to use all of this, or you don't need to know all of this in order to use Cilium. If you don't want to write bytecode in this low-level format, there is a tool chain that is available that makes this simple. This is the tool chain that Cilium leverages. So it's possible to write pseudo C code or source code and then leverage the LLVM uh, compiler suite with a BPF backend that can translate into BPF bytecode. And this is, this is the easiest way to leverage or write BPF programs. After, after you have bytecode, you can load that into the kernel. And as you load it into the kernel, the kernel will look at the bytecode and it will send it through a verifier. So why do we need a verifier? If you load code into the kernel, for example, via a Linux module, a kernel module, if the kernel module has a bug, it will crash your kernel, which is why typically you don't want to load Linux kernel modules on your production systems, because it have negative side effects. In particular, you don't want to load untested um, kernel modules. So BPF is different. BPF has a verifier which will look at the bytecode as you load it into the kernel, and it will it will figure out whether the bytecode is safe to run. So it will look at every instruction and it will verify whether, for example, there is a loop. And if there is a loop, it will, it will reject the packet and say, you cannot loop, this is possibly dangerous. Or if it, if it figures out that uh, you're leaking kernel memory, it will say, no, you cannot leak kernel memory to user space. So it, builds, it will look at the bytecode and figure out whether it's safe to run the BPF bytecode. After verification, we still have bytecode. So basically, it's almost like Java. You have bytecode that you can run. Bytecode run in, in software is relatively slow. So what BPF and the Linux kernel do instead is they parse that through a JIT compiler, a just-in-time compiler, which will take the BPF bytecode and translate it into native instructions that your CPU understands. So x86, ARM, whatever. There's JIT compilers. Just recently, a couple of days ago, work has started on Spark 64. So we have, we have JIT compilers for various CPU types essentially allowing you, uh, us to generate bytecode or generate uh, source code, compile it into bytecode, load it into the kernel, the kernel verifies, 
and then did compile it and run it at native speed. So it's almost as if we could recompile the kernel on the fly, which is the very powerful uh, aspect of BPF. Once you have this, this bytecode in the kernel, you can attach it to multiple hook points inside a kernel. The one example we're looking at first is you can attach it and run it for every network packet that is being received. So every packet that is being received from the network, we can pass um, through the BPF program. And the BPF program can then look at it and, for example, redirect it into a proxy, or it can redirect into a network namespace where your container is running. But BPF is more. BPF is an opportunity to rethink how policy enforcement is being done. So let's look at how exactly we do that right now. So when, you, when a container or an application um, sends traffic or sends a connection or attempts a connection request, it will do a connect system call to initiate a TCP connection or a, or a UDP connection. The kernel will pick that up and in the TCP stack, it will start constructing network packets. And it will send those network packets, typically through a VF pair or through a VXLAN device or something, out, out of the container and into the actual host kernel. And in the host kernel, typically, we have something like IP tables running, which will look at every packet and figure out whether that packet is allowed to go through or not. And if it's not allowed, we will either drop the packet in which case the application will time out because like, the connect system call just didn't receive any response, or it will actually send back a reset packet, a TCP RST, in which case you get a um, um, connection refused. But we've gone through a lot of trouble just to do policy enforcement. So we have created packets, we sent that through millions of lines of code, TCP code, all of that, why? Is that even needed? So can we do better? And this is where BPF comes in. So let's go back. We have our connect system call that the, the application container is making. We read, we re-add the tool chain that we already have, and we can now attach a BPF program to the LSM hook for every connect system call that is being made. So we have a BPF program that runs whenever the application container does a connect. And it can simply look at the destination and say, you're not allowed to do that, and return an error. So we don't even go as far as to construct packets or even go into the TCP stack we can enforce policy right at the system call level, which means it's faster, it's more secure because we don't even run through millions of lines of TCP code if, they, if there's an issue, so the application isn't even allowed to go through the TCP stack. So BPF gives us an opportunity to rethink on how application policy enforcement is being done. All right, low balancing. So this is what Jerome has been talking about, which I think is very, very exciting. How many of you have heard of IPVS? Like, obviously you've heard of IPVS last keynote, all right? So for those who don't know IPVS, IPVS is basically a load, load balancing facility inside the Linux kernel that is built on top of NetFilter, which is the uh, network firewalling solution inside, an, inside the kernel. So user space is called IP tables, and the kernel portion of that is called NetFilter. I'm not sure why they use different names or why we started using different names, but we do. Um, IPVS allows you to define virtual IPs and then low balance. And uh, Jerome basically sat this slide already, so what, what if I told you you can do IPVS but ten times, 10 times faster? And this is where XDP comes in. And Facebook released these numbers uh, two weeks ago, and then they're not willing to share the exact numbers, they're only willing to share the, the difference in um, performance. I've, I've linked the, the slides, which they used at the bottom, and also in the QR code. What we see is the bottom line is IPVS throughput, and the line on top is XDP low balancing. And I will explain in a, in, a, in a second what that means. When we talk layer three, layer four low balancing, so what does that actually do? That means we receive packets from, for example, a cloud low balancer or your hardware, ECMP hardware low balancers, and you look at the destination IP and you perform layer three, layer four low balancing, and for example, send that to a layer seven proxy or to your containers. And that's what Facebook is doing, and they have been using IPVS in the past. They open source the, the control plane code as well, and recently they started switching over to BPF and XDP, which gives them this um, performance advantage. So what exactly is B XDP? I, I've been talking about BPF for now. Like, why are we talking XDP now? 
So this is regular BPF mode, which means we receive packets. The packets go through the driver, they go through the Linux network stack, and inside that network stack is our BPF program. XDP allows us to offload that program into the network driver, which means it will run very, very close to the actual hardware. It will gain access to the DMA buffer directly, which means instead of even going to the CPU, and those of you have, have like an, um, uh, a harder background, you know that just copying data from the NIC onto memory uh, is expensive. If we can run a program and give, give, give that program access to the DMA, bu DMA buffer that that's, uh, has, a, has, a, um, has, has, um, has a lot of power. In that BPF program running in a driver, we can either then drop the packet, for example, if the policy does not allow the packet to go through. We can send it to the stack, to the Linux stack, so it will be received by the TCP stack, and it will, for example, Cilium will um, receive it there. Or we can, do, we can perform low balancing and just put it back on the wire. And this is what Facebook is doing. So they have a multi-stage program written in BPF that will do low balancing and will also do automatic DDoS mitigation. So they basically imply or implement not only local balancing, but they can, only, they can also act against DDoS, um, DDoS, DDoS um, attacks. So how can I use BPF with Docker? And we already saw the demo um, which showed that, but the project that you can use or the project that aims at bringing BPF technology to Docker and container, the container ecosystem is called Cilium. And this is what we have been working on for the last 16 months or so. So how does Cilium work? Cilium runs as an agent on every, comp on every compute node, on every worker, on every server. And it, will, it has plugins so it can interact with Docker through LibNetwork or it will receive Docker events, for example, whenever a local, local container is started. It will then... Um, compile a BPF program and inject and run that in the kernel as whenever a container is being started. I'll say that again. So whenever a container is started, we look at the configuration of that uh, container, uh, look at the labels of that container, and we then generate a program which is specifically tailored to that container and load it into the kernel and attach it to the container. So if, we, uh, if a second container is started, we generate a second BPF program and uh, and check that as well. And at that point, these containers can start talking to each other. That doesn't give us network connectivity yet, so in order to achieve network connectivity, we compile a program and attach it to the network device, and we can hook them up. So now our containers can start talking to the network. And this shows you the picture. This is really, this is really an, an architecture that is close to microservices. It's we, 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 we generate and run very, very specifically crafted and tailored services, BPF programs, attach them to containers and network devices, and now we can glue them together. Solim will typically run in the background as it receives um, like um, label events or container create events. Um, but it, there is a CLI, so if you, if you want to list the endpoints locally, if you want to import policy, there's a CLI. There is a monitoring component, which will, for example, allow you to see packets that are being dropped. So whenever there is a policy violation, we will show that in the monitoring component. And we have a policy repo, which contains the policy uh, rules. So layer three policies, layer four policies, layer seven policies. The project status, so we just did our initial first release two weeks ago. We're definitely looking for uh, feedback and contributions. It's still an early project, but we have implemented the, the core uh, features that we want, and we're now stabilizing and putting a release process in, in place. Uh, it's been very exciting to, to hear about Linux Kit um, and Mobi, which is a perfect framework to deploy something like Cilium and to start playing around with Cilium. So we will definitely have a uh, Mobi YAML file very soon, which will allow you to deploy Cilium easily. If you don't want to wait for the Mobi YAML file, so we have a getting started Vagrant box, which you can go to the GitHub um, Cilium repo, you can clone the repo, you can go into the examples getting started directory and just run Vagrant up, and it will boot a Vagrant box, and it will run Cilium as a container image, and you can start playing around. We do have um, documentation that comes along with it, which allows you to run through 
the steps required to install layer three policy, layer four policy, layer seven policy, and so on. So if you want to play around with it, this is a perfect way um, to learn and to learn more about Solum. So to summarize, what have we heard? So first of all, never, under, never underestimate the Jedi. <laughs> Second, traditional layer three, layer four policies are not sufficient. Like everything runs over a single port. By opening up and allowing that port to communicate with another service, you open up the entire API service, which is not least privilege. So in, in the age of microservices, we need uh, HTTP API function of our security policies. BPF and XDP will drive the networking um, or software-based networking of the future. We see Facebook very forward-looking deploying this, and the benefits are very obvious. I think Cilium will bring these benefits to a wider audience um, in, 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 an, in um, an abstracted form, integrated with Docker and so on. And we also bring layer seven policies. So in, in, instead of focusing on layer three, layer four networking policies only, we uh, allow, Cilium allows to um, enforce layer seven fine grade policies. And with that, we have about seven minutes uh, left for questions. But before we open up for questions, I want to remember that Docker has asked me to rem remember you to vote. Um, we have t-shirts and we have stickers. And given this is the last talk, talk before the lunch break, we will, we will distribute tickets and stickers up front here. So if you would like to have a sticker or t-shirt, please just come front, um, up front. If you want to chat with me over this week, feel free to uh, direct message me on um, Twitter. And we also have a Twitter handle, Cilium Project. And Cilium.io is our main website, which will link you to the GitHub repo as well. And with that, I think we can open it up for questions. What are you using for the, the proxy component that you, that you showed? Is it user space? Is it yes. the kernel? So right now, we're leveraging a user space proxy. The so Cilium BPF program is generic, so you can hook any proxy in that you would want. It basically allows you to redirect to a port in user space, so we could run something like HAProxy, Nginx. Right now, in the demo, we have used uh, Oxy, the Oxy framework that uh, was written by Melgun guys. It's a Golang HTTP middleware, middleware um, layer. Um, cool project. Uh, so you said the BPF program is loaded inside the container namespace. Is that right? No, the, 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 the BPF programs run in the host namespace. So if typically, if you have a separate namespace, you have a VEATH pair, it would attach to the VEATH end that's on the host facing side. So it's outside of the container image. If we're talking system call enforcement, that would be inside the container image or inside the container namespace, not the image, but the container namespace. Okay, so system call are the only ones that's running inside the container namespace in this yes. case. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, how do you do layer seven enforcement? Ah, sorry. How do you do layer seven enforcement over the, if the traffic is encrypted, like with TLS? So if the, the, that's a good question. So what, what would you do if the traffic is encrypted? Then you need to share the secret with the okay. proxy. Like any proxy, if you want to enforce security, we need to have the visibility to do so. Share the certificates. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a so, question back there. I think there was also a question. Yes. Uh, can we then an application which is working on libpcap by using the BPF? Can you repeat the first part again? I'm not sure. I'm, I can. can we then an application which is working over B, uh, libpcap for packet mapping and getting the L2 information and doing the... Are you asking whether, if an application is using libpcap, whether we can see that traffic? Yeah. Yes, we can. So BPF will hook at uh, the TC layer, the traffic control layer, which sees all packets, even before it goes to libpcap. And um, but it, pcap will, will make a clone of the packet, so we cannot control what goes into pcap. Pcap will see all of the packets. We cannot in, like we cannot hide the packet from PCAP. Uh, if I want to run a libpcap application over the VPF, mm -hmm. can I get the traffic? Yes. Um, I'm up here. Are you done? Um, I had a quick question about your Kubernetes integration. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, can you elaborate a little bit? I, security policy is relatively new, and it doesn't include any specification for layer four yet, yes. as far as I'm aware. So are you putting an annotation in there? 
Yes. How does that work? All right, so we do have a CNI plugin which will do networking and we do support the network policy specification resource or the resource of, of currently does um, ingress only layer three, layer four. Okay. So you can specify ports. Um, we are currently working on proposing layer seven in that uh, specification as well. Uh, in the meantime, if that is not going quick enough, we might start adding support for um, annotations. But we would try and we would like to try in the official path to propose this properly and get it standardized first. Okay, thank you. Are there any um, open source projects you're aware of for composing uh, BPF or Cilium uh, with uh, unikernels? Or using unikernels? Composing unikernels. That's a, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, are you talking about a specific unikernel or in general? If, if, if specifically, I use the JVM a lot, so with uh, one okay. of, any of the JVM unikernels. So BPF requires a BPF runtime, uh, which is currently only available inside the Linux kernel. So if, if this uh, should be supported inside unikernel, then that, that unikernel code base needs to support a full BPF runtime. I'm personally not aware that any unikernel has done that, um, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, two questions. Uh, so, in Cilium is used as a network plugin uh, only for the policy, or we would uh, does it do all the things that a network plugin would do? Yeah. So, Cilium does all of networking, um, okay. and it does it can do local balancing. So, for, for example, it can, can do cube services, um, or you can do, use our the Cilium API to do local balancing, and it can do policy. So, basically, it does networking, local balancing, and policy. Okay, and in the example you gave, uh, is XDP also, you know, like, because that was mainly for policy purposes. Yep. So if you have to use uh, Cilium with XDP, is there anything special we need to do? Yes, so XDP requires the network driver to support this, okay. uh, which means in Reason kernel, this includes the well-known NICs uh, from the well-known uh, vendors, not all of them yet, and you can, um, I don't want to mention the, the, the vendors here right now, but feel free to chat me up and I can, I, can, I can give you the actual vendors that support this right now. But there's a lot of momentum going on and all the major vendors are starting to support this. So okay. it's only a matter of time until this is widely supported. Okay, thank you. Question here. Uh, is it possible to do decryption of the traffic in uh, BPF or XDF? <laughs> there is actually someone who wrote an entire cipher algorithm in BPF. Um, so it is possible. Um, it's not the way we will look at how to do encryption. So the one big advantage of, of BPF is that it can interact with the Linux kernel through so-called BPF helper calls, which means it can call into the kernel and actually leverage existing technology. And that's how we, we um, currently work on an encryption um, in, in IPsec integration with BPF. So the BPF would specify the key, would specify, yes, you need to encrypt this packet, but the actual encryption and decryption would still happen through IPsec or standard um, kernel, kernel components. But it, technically, it's absolutely possible to do um, encryption in BPF itself. XDP. Um, so that's a little bit more difficult because at XDP level, we, we don't have access to the full kernel components yet because it's so early. So that's an open question, but that's definitely very interesting. So there's a lot of discussion right now to integrate KTLS, like kernel TLS into the kernel. And as that goes in, um, the question to support that in XDP mode is definitely out there. It definitely makes sense. And if it's technically feasible, we'll definitely do it. Hi. Um, oh. A uh, question, it's, it's very uh, common in uh, enterprise over here. <laughs> very common in enterprise to run RHEL, uh, RHEL 7, which yes. has got an ancient kernel. So uh, um, what are the, the kernel version uh, requirements? Right, so the kernel version requirement is 4.8 if you want to not run a Linux kernel module. Um, which means with CoreOS, Fedora, Ubuntu development images, it will all work flawlessly. With RHEL 6, it, you will need to run a kernel module which will port the BPF runtime to RHEL. But as it has been done before, there has been a, a company called Plumgrid that has been using BPF in the past to run an STN product, and they are actually have a, a kernel module that will provide a sufficient BPF runtime which Cilium can leverage. But I do know that Reddit is working on uh, backporting BPF 
Um, currently evaluating RHEL 7, but for RHEL 8, it will definitely be there. Hi. Uh, uh, you mentioned that you need a Cilium agent running uh, even for Kubernetes or CNI kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, does it mean it has to always run, or can I just, is there a module that I can just execute? Like, can this run outside of Kubernetes just by invoking a libcni call? Um, the agent is required to, like, the, plug, the CNI plugin will interact with the agent um, oh, and will, will generate the BPF bytecode and then load it. Once it's loaded, the agent actually doesn't need to run any longer. So even if the agent crashes, the kernel stuff will continue running and the network traffic will continue working. The reason why we have a daemon is because we want to receive events such as policy has changed or a new container has been started um, because we need to receive the labels of the containers and CNI currently does not give us okay. the labels of the actual container. So the container, sorry, the Cilium agent is definitely needed then? I, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my second question is, uh, you mentioned integration with Nix. Uh, will this run in an environment like EC2 where the interface devices are virtualized? Can you repeat that question again? So in an in environment like EC2, where mm -hmm. I get fake network interfaces, yeah. will it still work with that? Or is this a bare metal thing because you need like uh, some Nix specific logic? In so there? it doesn't need any Nix specific logic. All you need is a Linux kernel that is reasoned enough, and it will work. So it is okay. not, it's not bound to specific hardware. XDP is bound to specific driver uh, features. But even if XDP is not available, certainly we can do everything in software, just slower. Okay, thanks. And let's have one last question over there. Then if you have more questions, uh, you can always find Thomas after, of course. Hey, uh, over here. I can barely see anything. Here, here. <laughs> so do you have a way to keep counters for um, the hits and the misses and the drops? Yes, so this is the, the, the big benefit of BPF. We can, we can regenerate these BPF programs and adapt them in any way. So. Right now, we have counters um, on container level, on service level, on connection level. If you need additional counters, we could add them easily. Uh, but yes, we do maintain counters. Um, and we do maintain them in a very efficient way using per CPU hash tables. So it actually is not as a minimal impact on actual over, overall uh, network throughput. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for this awesome presentation. One last round of applause before we all head to lunch. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you.